Well, the given topic is the day of the Lord. This will be his fourth installment on this new series of messages on the second coming. We welcome our live stream viewers tonight. I know you'd be benefited by the meeting tonight. We're also glad to see Sister Vanita and her son, Brother Abe, here again tonight. When the world started, it was somewhere just a rough estimate of many scientists around 4,000 years before Christ, B.C. And Eden throughout all the world, for the slightest bit of time that we know about, everything was perfect. Everything was as it should be. Of course, then sin entered in the world and things started going downhill. They haven't, start, they haven't stopped going down. But this is what I was talking about this morning. When the first year of the world ended, the year didn't go from 4000 BC to 4001. It went from 4000 to 3999. It went down. It started counting down from there. But what was it counting down to? It was counting down to when Christ came. It was counting down to when Christ came into the world to take away sin in another estimate, 33 AD. Now this AD is Anno Domini. It's what AD stands for. It's Latin for a phrase. It means the year of our Lord. It's what AD is for. Now, today the years are counting up. And we can say just another rough estimate that it's been somewhere close to 2013 years since Christ was born in the flesh. So since the years then counted down, leading to Christ, the years now count up, leading to Christ's second coming. So when He comes and the days of the earth are fulfilled, everything will once again be perfect. And that's the way it'll be forever. Everything will be as it should be, and nothing will be out of order. The same as it was some 6,000 years ago when the world began. <clears throat> now time isn't an issue with God. I looked at Brother Given's topic and saw the day singular of the Lord. Now in this world, the day is 24 hours long, midnight to midnight. <clears throat> and each month is on average of 30 days long, but we're still not sure about that one, so we throw in an extra day in February every four years or so, so we can try to even it out. Well, all it is, it's a lot of uncertainty, and God doesn't have to deal with any of it at all. He created time so He can direct it any way He pleases. In Joshua 10, verses 12 and 13, it says this, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. He said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou, moon, in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day, which is what we might consider 24 hours. So God was before time was. He created time. He's timeless. There, time is non-existent when it comes to God. Birthdays, calendars, they're all oriented by time. Everything else, just about everything else that we have in this world revolves around it. I referenced this text at the men's meeting, Psalms 90, chapter 4. Psalms chapter 90, verse 4 through 6. For a thousand years on thy side are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night thou carriest them away, away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening is cut down and withereth. Now the reason I say all this about time is because we're used to saying today, that means before tomorrow, we will do this and we'll do that and all this other stuff, but our God's idea of a day is not the same as our idea of a day. A day in His course is as a thousand and a thousand as one. So I say this, because we can't fully know how much time the day of the Lord is going to be while we're in these mortal bodies. It's beyond our mortal bodies to know what will happen in what amount of time 
in the day of the Lord. So I'm going to be looking at three things in particular that we are assured of in scriptures that will happen in the day of the Lord. And the second coming of Christ itself is the first that I want to look at. It's, I'd like to read a text from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the com coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall def descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with a chump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Now this event is going to be anything but quiet. Brother Gibbon has made this point numerous times before. Christ came under disguise or incognito the first time, and that's not going to happen the second time. So first Christ, Jesus comes in the clouds with a shout, and as if that wasn't enough, the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. So it's going to be quite noisy. Nobody's going to escape their attention being given to this event. So no whisperings are going to be heard from heaven on this day. God's not going to say, Hey, my people, Christ is coming over here. It's not going to happen. God is vocal when it comes to his son. He says, he descends with a shout. So nobody's going to escape giving their attention to this. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because this is too important of an event to not give our attention to. Now, the same things that we see and hear on this day will bring incredible joy to us. And the same acts and sounds will bring utter doom and destruction to those who refuse the way of Christ. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, And said to the mount, rocks and mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And the answer to that, who shall be able to stand question, is those who gird, the, gird up the loins of their mind and keep the oil in our lamps burning, which is the remnant, the saints. Now another part of this day is the judgment day. Before I go into the day itself, I'd like to make a point about the word judgment itself. Now, this point has been made before, but it's still good to make. A judgment is not strictly a punishment, and it's not strictly a blessing. A judgment is to deal a person what they rightly deserve for the works they've done. Hebrews 2.2, 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedient received a just recompense of reward. So every man will receive according to his deeds a just reward. God is not unjust in the rewards he gives, whether it be to his saints or whether it be to the wicked. Nothing he does is unjust. Now, with this in view, we'll look at the day of judgment. Now, the real thing, the real deal, judgment day, is the complete opposite of what false teachers are putting out today. Jesus will not reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. The saints will not be taken out of the world before the wicked as a special privilege. It's not going to happen. Well, then they ask, what is going to happen? I'll tell you, a division is going to be made. There's going to be a separation made. Wheat, chaff, goats, sheep, depart from me, I knew ye not. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of my rest. Gather the wheat into my barns and bind up the chaff and burn it. This is what's going to happen. And even though I named all those, all of those are, at essence, the same thing. The division is being made between God children and the children of the wicked one. That's at the bottom line. That's what the division is made. <clears throat> now, this text that I'm going to read in Revelation chapter 14 is another way to view Judgment Day. And from this, we see that there will be no mercy showed to those who rejected the way of Christ. This is chapter 14 in Revelation, verses 14 through 19, if you want to turn there and read with me. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice. There's that loud voice again. 
Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar which had the power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And God's mercy is for those who want it. And those who refuse this way obviously don't want God's mercy, so no mercy will be given. Now I wanted to share something about the right hand of God that I really found interesting. And we're used to, when giving directions, say, continue down this road for such and such miles and then turn right or turn left at this light or something of that nature. But the first definition that comes up of right in Merriam-Webster's dictionary is righteousness or uprightness. <clears throat> so the real definition of right has nothing to do with the, the direction that's the opposite of left. has nothing to do with it. <clears throat> This is a good parallel of God's people. They, like God, we, I should say, like God, are full of righteousness, so we go to His right hand while the goats are parted to His left. But here's the key. We can't get to God's right hand because of anything we ourselves do. Our works won't get us there. God's own right hand gets us to His right hand. If it weren't for God, then we'd be empty vessels, like Brother Jeremy said this morning. We get to God right's hand by God. We can't be presented, let alone be accepted, before God on our own. And my third and final point is the day that both the second coming and the judgment lead up to, and that's the everlasting day. A day that never ends and one with no night. I want to focus on no night here for just a little bit. James 1.17 says, Every good, good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. No shadow of turning perfectly describes God. It's perfect. He's all light. He's all life. Darkness has nothing to do with God. God has nothing to do with darkness, and darkness has nothing to do with God. And the same is vice versa for the devil and light. It's, he's repelled by it. So if God is like that, why wouldn't his dwelling place be? Since God has no shadow of turning, then his dwelling place will have no shadow. It will have no darkness. It will always be light in heaven. Heaven is a place that won't conflict with his nature. God won't dwell in a place that is contradictory to the way he is. And heaven is one of those places that doesn't interfere with that. <clears throat> John 14, 2, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now heaven is that place that He went to prepare for us. It's a new heavens and a new earth where we'll never grow old and the soul never dies. That's how the songwriter put it. Heaven will be our permanent dwelling place. There will be no more going in and there will be no more going out in that day. Now I'm going to read a couple texts, both from Romans, chapter 120 and verses 2-7, and then connect them both in view of this eternal day. This is 120. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are not without excuse. And 2-7, to them who are by to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now this, with, to some degree, has to do with what I was speaking about earlier. We've got God's habitation having no shadow and God also having no shadow of turning. <clears throat> if God's power is eternal, there's no reason that His dwelling place shouldn't also be eternal. And it is eternal. We know that. Heaven will never be finished and have to be folded up like a vesture or a garment, as stated in Hebrews. Back to God's power. 
It's never a good thing when it's against you, but when it's for you, there's nothing that's formed against you that, that can stand. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, heaven, <clears throat> heaven won't be disappointing when we get there. There will be nothing, nothing that we see or nothing that we hear or anything that we come into contact with. Nothing will make us stand back and think, you know, God could have done better. Nothing will make us think that because God's power is eternal. In John's vivid description of the new Jerusalem, the small part that he saw makes us realize that this world is exactly nothing compared to heaven. Now, if there were such a thing as uh, middle-class housings in heaven, then they would be infinitely better than the best of the elite that this world has to offer. But, of course, we know that there are no middle-class housings in heaven. There's no old run-down neighborhoods that are good for nothing. All of heaven is going to be productive. There's not one part of heaven that will be unproductive. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, heaven is a 26. And this earth, which is temporal, which is mortal, which will be folded up like a garment, like a vesture, will be finished, and it's about a negative 26. So let's just keep this in mind. When we think about the day of the Lord, we have to keep it in the forefront of our minds, because if we're not ready for the day of the Lord, then we won't be ready for the Lord Himself. Let us continue to be ready.